Once in Future Church, and we're going to explore this incredible tide that we sense of home fellowships. It's really astonishing to me as I travel, not just the United States, but also abroad. I sense that there are groups meeting in homes all over the world spontaneously, and some are doing it very constructively, some are doing it very, in very different ways. So we're not here to criticize it or, or to pass judgment. We're trying to understand it and understand its biblical relevance. But before we start, let me ask you a question. Why is the divorce rate among Christians no better than among non-believers? I think uh, there have been so many studies, and the more you study them, the more discouraging it is. You would think that w there would be a statistically discernible difference between Christians and non-believers, and you sometimes get the impression that it's worse, if not equal. And we could take many other statistics. You can talk to doctors, have them pull the file drawer open of their unpaid, uncollected invoices, and that'll be his, their Christian clients. Same thing with the Christian attorneys. Somehow, we try to avoid the reality that Christians as a group have a cloudy reputation among non-believers. In fact, Gandhi in India, when asked what did he feel was the biggest obstacle to Christianity in India, his classic reply was Christians. When we watch Christian media, many of us are startled with what we see in some of the television broadcasts. What's going on? And let's ask ourselves another question. What is really meant by the second commandment? Thou, uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What does that really mean? I personally believe it doesn't have anything to do with swearing. That's a whole different issue. Taking the name, the authority, the image, the reputation of God upon yourself in vain is what that's talking about. If we're his ambassadors, we have an obligation. As we look at ourselves in the mirror, as we look at our friends throughout the body, many times we have to ask ourselves, what's going on? So I'm going to suggest the possibility that there's a, what I'll call a regeneration gap. The, apparently, there are over 2,000 churches planted every week, we understand. And from 1974 to 1998, the denomination, the Christian, Christian uh, nominal Christians at least, went from 150 million to 650 million. So it all sounds good as you look at the statistics. But what they don't record is that silent exodus of people slipping out the back doors, almost unnoticed. People who were brought up in Christian homes get married. They try it for a while, but they find it's not that relevant in their lives, and they drift away. And uh, they're attracted, but not contained. They're interested, but they're not inserted in a fellowship. They're harvested, but not gathered. They're touched, but not transformed. They looked in briefly, but were disappointed in what they saw. That painfully describes too many, too many people that we run into. In fact, what I'd like to do at this point is pause for a minute, and at the risk of sounding repetitive or self-centered, I think it is appropriate for me to give you a little bit of background on myself. I was raised in Southern California by European parents. My dad was Polish or Austrian. My mother was German. And uh, so as a first-generation American, that means something special, of course. I discovered at an early age I had an aptitude for technology. I was heading, in effect, uh, through a math science major into a a program with Stanford in electrical engineering when I got an appointment to the Naval Academy. And that did something. The glamour of that attracted me, of course, but it also gave me something that I've never out outgrown, a passion for adventure. And the Naval Academy years were fabulous, and I took my commission in the Air Force, which was a highly desired option in those days. We're talking 1956 graduation, just to calibrate this a little bit. After the Air Force, I was in the Department of Defense in a number of different ways, working for think tanks, for the intelligence community, and uh, ultimately uh, into the corporate boardrooms. So uh, I was launched on a 30-year career of corporate development as an engineer turned uh, manager, a businessman. I uh, spent 30 years, um, in effect, buying and selling troubled high-technology companies. That was my career path. 
But along the way, let me back up. When I was a teenager, I developed a deep love for the Scripture. And uh, one of my primary hobbies all through that career was Bible study. I just always have loved the Bible. I've collected books on it. Just it, it was probably the principal hobby among my other interests. And I made a key discovery along the way. My personal background or technology background is in the information sciences. And one of the things that I discovered for myself, and it's become the main pillar of our ministry, is that these 66 books that we call the Bible, even though they're penned by over 40 different guys who didn't even know each other, over a thousand, over 2,000, about 2,000 years, 40 authors, 66 books, over, say, call it almost 2,000 years, it's an integrated message, the discovery that it's designed, that every detail in there is uh, engineered to fit a particular role. And many of the elements anticipate things that happen thousands of years later. So not only is it an integrated design, it has its origin from outside the time domain. That insight grew as my technology background grew and has become a major preoccupation of myself. I think once somebody discovers that for themselves, it gives you an entirely different perspective of the Scripture. And I must confess, it gives you a certain impatience with some of the criticisms from the would-be experts that argue, did Moses really write the books of Moses and so forth. All those arguments betray an ignorance of the depth, the structure, the design of the Scripture itself. But in any case, during my executive career, I had an opportunity, in fact, I was requested by the government of Algeria to be their consultant, so I had an opportunity to, to uh, uh, assist them in some computer problems they had. And um, as part of an incentive to come back and elaborate some plans that I had outlined for them, they uh, offered to have my family come along with me. And well, we did that. My, my two sons, my wife and I, had an opportunity in North Africa to spend a, a few weeks helping the Algerian government. What the Algerians didn't know, they, I used the funds from that consulting to extend my travels from there to Israel. And in about 1970, uh, we, our family, just on our own, just showed up <laughs> and went through Israel. Um, and that was our first exposure. I don't think the Algerians knew <laughs> that they were funding such a trip, but that's a whole other story. But uh, when I got back from uh, that trip at our local church, uh, I naturally gave a little uh, trip report of what we'd seen and so forth in Israel, and uh, uh, I gave it a, a prophetic uh, perspective, which startled many of the people that were attending that uh, evening uh, group, because it, it, many people in denominational churches have no concept of the second coming, no real insight into eschatology and the reality of what's going on in Israel, the reality of the times we live uh, hit home. So. Many of the people there asked, gee, can we continue this discussion? Because it went on to late hours of the night that weekend. And uh, so we, they all said, uh, gee, can we come over to your house and talk about this? So that next Monday, I said, sure, come on over. So we had, I think, something like uh, 30 or 40 people show up at our home that Monday and, and just to discuss some of the things that we'd learned in Israel. And that was so vibrant. They asked me at the time, gee, would you take us through uh, The Late Great Planet Earth, which was the popular book at that time by Hal Lindsey. And I indicate, which is something that uh, I was very impressed by and, and I used to point people to. But I said, that, no, I won't do that. But if you want to go through a book of the Bible, we could go through the book of Revelation. How about that? How, how would that be? And they jumped on that. So that started what became the Monday Night Series. We did it in our home for uh, a period of time. And as we outgrew that, we found someone that had larger uh, spaces in their home. And we were in home Bible studies for a couple of years before we outgrew that. We finally ended up moving and being invited to and then moving to the Fellowship Hall at Calvary Chapel. And we taught there for, oh, 25 years, 30 years, something like that, uh, in the Fellowship Hall and then eventually moved to the main sanctuary. But the point is, these mon our whole background, our whole um, uh, uh, early years in the ministry were really in the format of a home Bible study. And so... Um, but it was also going on, tapes from those studies got distributed by several ministries, not the least of which was the, the Firefighters for Christ. And uh, uh, our whole orientation all along was to put uh, teaching the Word of God above all things. And God has blessed that. We finally... Uh,